to the Afterglow. It's a special edition tonight. Dr. Jermone Glenn's book release, Take Your Seat. Can we have some noise in the audience? We are so excited tonight to be able to celebrate this auspicious occasion with him. It's a special edition of the Afterglow, and I am so excited to be with you tonight. My name is Dr. Angela Martin, so thank you all. Thank you all so much for being here. To those of you that are on our online audience, let's just uh, make some noise for online. Come on, online. Come on, you can do a little better than that. Let's welcome online. <laughs> You are with us as well tonight, so make sure that you uh, have this experience in the chat. You can always comment, you can ask questions, you can be a part of this experience in the chat tonight as well. So, Dr. Jamone Glenn. Dr. Angie Martin, <laughs> what's up? We are here, we Listen, are here. I have waited <laughs> so long to get you to be my guest on Afterglow. <laughs> And here I am. We have taken the seats and swapped seats yes, tonight. Yes, and yes. Uh, I'm actually your guest on the Afterglow. <laughs> <laughs> but I am so glad that you are here. You are amazing. One of my favorite people. Likewise. You know, uh, I love you so much. And Likewise. so dearly. And thank you for lending Likewise. your expertise, your many Likewise. years and hosting mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. broadcasting and just doing what you do uh, to, to, to this moment. You. Thank you so much for being here. You are more than us. welcome. Uh, I am excited everybody, to be here. Everybody in the chat, tell and say, what's up, Dr. Angie Martin? <laughs> so good. So I'm good. so happy to be here. It's just a beautiful night, isn't it? It is a beautiful I night. I mean, the energy in the room, there's so much love here. So we're just going to have a conversation tonight about, about, about the book. It's an amazing book. Can I just say, first of all, aesthetically, this book is just, I love it. <laughs> Don't you all love the book? I mean, just aesthetically. I love the size of it, you know, I, lo I love the weight of it, yeah. you know, that's a euphemism because it is quite weighty, you know, <laughs> when you read this book, it is weighty, Thank but you. I just love it. I mean, I don't know um, if people really realize all that it takes for you to get this to this point, yeah. you know, so it's a beautiful book. So congratulations on that as well. And Thank also you. just for writing a book, I'm, uh, I am an author. Yes, you are. I only wrote one little book. It's a good book. It takes a lot. <laughs> right. That's and right. so now, after I wrote that book, Dr. Glenn, I just had such a, um, a, an appreciation for authors because you don't just write a book. You birth a book. That's right. You process a book. Yeah. I mean, you sleep with it. That's you, right. It, it keeps you awake at night. And even after all of the edits, sometimes you'll think, I wanted to put something else in it. And yeah. Isn't it the truth? It's true. It's like uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. people often ask me about my book writing process. Yes, right? yes. And so, of course, I have a team. I have a support system that helps me do it. But mm -hmm. usually after I finish the first draft, I won't mm -hmm. touch it beyond mm -hmm. two or three times. Three is my max. Okay. Because every time the editors give it back to me, I want to change mm -hmm. I got a different revelation. There's something else I want to say. Uh, mm -hmm. There's something I meant to say differently mm -hmm. that I'm not sure if it translated properly. So after the third time or second time that they give it back, I just let it be and, and, and leave it up to God to do the interpretation in the hearts of people and mm -hmm. then I don't touch it anymore. And then mm -hmm. they tell me, well, if you have more things to say, the revelation keeps living, put it in a master class, put it mm -hmm. in a study guide, put it in a in a live, put it in a podcast, put it in an interview. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is a great opportunity because hopefully the book speaks to you in a way that after you read it, it keeps talking to you mm -hmm. and you keep hearing things and reflecting on your own journey mm -hmm. and reflecting on your own process so it's alive it is a spirit led and so it is jesus said the words that i speak to you are spirit they are life mm -hmm. so it's alive and so it's still speaking but yeah it's quite the process and, and at some point you just got to take yeah. your hands off and trust the process because right. yeah. it definitely has a pulse and a heartbeat exactly it's continuing to go That's i right. must say that when i was reading your book i love it it's it's Thank amazing you. and um dr glenn I'm, I'm, I'm reading my book i'm sitting in my room reading reading the book and I'm talking to you as I'm reading the book. <laughs> I'm like, ooh, Dr. Glenn, that was good. <laughs> All, I mean, I was out loud. I was talking to you. I was like, ooh, that was good. That, that awesome. was real good. Thank you. That Thank was you. real good. So, I mean, because when you, when you speak, when you teach, when you, when you preach, um, 
you 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 just lay down so many gems. Mm -hmm. So literally, Dr. Glenn, when you speak in your books or whatever, everything really could be a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't wow. it the truth, you guys? <laughs> Isn't it the truth? Because there are so many things that he says, even while you're preaching, yeah. it's like, okay, that could be a t-shirt, yeah. that could be on a mug, that could be on a cup. I mean, it's just everything you say, you know, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely worth Thank worth you. that. Thank you. I, yeah. think, I think that I don't try to waste words when, yeah. I'm, when I'm communicating. I, I think that You words, speak on purpose. Yeah, words matter. And, mm -hmm. and, and if you can say something that impacts a person and make mm -hmm. it memorable. I, I, I've been pastoring through, preaching through this like uh, Twitter, uh, social media kind of uh, quotables mm -hmm. generation, right? And so uh, I, I realized that in, in note taking, if you can phrase things in a way that it sticks with people and that it's quotable or memorable or you can tweet it or you can post it, it tends to stick with them in a way. And so the lexicon of lyrics and how how words work uh, are, are supposed to stick to you so you can pull them and reach for them in moments in time. So it's quite intentional mm -hmm. that I try to challenge my brain to phrase things in a way that is memorable, that it sticks with people when they mm -hmm. walk away. So thank you for mm -hmm. the affirmation of Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And for noticing that, yeah. uh, that, <laughs> that, that that actually is with intention. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Your purpose is, yeah, Thank you're on you. purpose. You're definitely doing that. So um, I want to, uh, before we move forward today, first of all, I just want to go back a little bit uh, to your childhood and just because, you know, it took a journey for you to get to this point. Yeah. And uh, what we're going to do today, um, for those of you that are watching and those of you in the audience, uh, I took a few quotes from the book, some actual quotes from Dr. Glenn, and then we're going to ask questions from those quotes so we can just elaborate on those just a bit. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, that's what we're going to do. So first of all, we're going to start with uh, these quotes that are actually from the book. When you, if you've already read your book, you've already seen these quotes, and if you haven't, you will see these quotes. Uh, one says, just because we're not living the exact dream that we had as children does not mean that we're not in alignment with the ideologies of our youth. Another quote, the journey to your dream is not always in a straight line. So our question to you tonight, uh, Dr. Glenn, what was your dream as a child and how did that dream uh, shape the way you approached your life? What were you thinking about? What was baby Glenn thinking about? Baby Dr. Glenn. Baby Dr. <laughs> Glenn. You what know, were you thinking about? I think that's such an apropos question. Mm -hmm. I think that when I was a child, you get glimpses, right? So God shows you a glimpse of your future. I always say uh, God can show you 70 years in seven seconds. You know, he can give you a glimpse of the future in one moment. I think I didn't know what I was doing, but I saw myself doing it. Mm. So I didn't know why I was in front of people. I didn't know why I was communicating. I didn't know why, as a child, I had a gift to gab, right? So I got in trouble for the things that end up being the, uh, the things that I get paid for now and make a living from. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and in fourth grade, I was told I was too talkative, right? So uh, my teacher would, 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 would literally discipline me for being a talkative child. My father, thankfully, defended me uh, in that space. Uh, well, is it the point to communicate? Are you afraid that a child that can articulate, you know, he would just challenge the fact that they would challenge my gift, my mm. natural gift. My father would tell me things when I was young, like, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to be an athlete, but you will be athletic. You're athletic, but not an athlete. You know, I would want to play, play sports because that's where my friends were uh, doing and he would tell me oh you you're athletic but you're not a, you're not an athlete you'll make your living with your mind with communication mm. so gr uh, begr begrudgingly he would have me reading books and copying words out of the dictionary and uh, communicating and articulating and he would use my, my father's uh, a very educated man and he would mm. use these really big words to me while I was a, a little child and when I would say well what does that mean he would say go look it up in a dictionary mm. uh, would force me to learn about words and so when I was young my dream was I saw myself communicating I saw myself 
on stage. I saw myself serving people in a way that was empowering, but I didn't know what that was. And so when I say that, that you might not be living that idea, but you're on that path, mm -hmm. on that journey. I mean, I think when I was in middle school and high school, my first way that I thought I would express that was through music. I, I love music. I love writing music. I love poetry. I love writing poetry. Uh, I, love, I love dancing and entertaining and communicating. I was a background singer in a group. Uh, I saw myself in that space. I thought I was going to be, we were going to be the next BBD, you know, like literally <laughs> BBD met me and when they met me, uh, I walked up to them. I was like, what's up? They looked at me. They were like, bro, you look like you could be the one of us. I was like, I actually was trying to be, you know, but, <laughs> but it didn't work out, you know, so I saw myself in places like that, but I didn't know what I was doing, but mm -hmm. the glimpse of it, God was designing the path and putting mm -hmm. that desire in my heart and showing me a glimpse of that so it wouldn't be familiar, so naturally, I tried to take that gift to the world, naturally, mm -hmm. I tried to take that to uh, my expression of myself outside of my faith but mm -hmm. then when I gave my life to Jesus he shifted that purpose mm -hmm. and start to reveal that in a, in a way that made sense for the kingdom of God mm -hmm. so I'm still doing what I saw myself doing I just mm -hmm. didn't know what I was doing when I was doing it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I think that if everybody gets in that space where they get back to the original idea that, that dream. Don't be afraid of that thing that, that was in your heart to do, in your spirit to do from a child, even if you don't know what it is, and start to move in that and explore that, you'll find that to be true. Because we have to protect our dreams because that's where the journey starts. Absolutely. Uh, my wife and I was having a, a conversation with our children just the other week mm -hmm. at dinner, and I set my whole family around the table, and I asked them all, Tell me your earliest dream. What was the earliest thing that you dreamed about before you got afraid, before you got uh, anybody try to talk you out of it, anybody put another ideology or idea in your head? What's your earliest idea of yourself? And as we went around the table, of course, my youngest son, who is the, the closest to the original idea, he was so sure about how he saw himself, what he saw, and what he wanted to do. And then as we went to my daughter, she had to go back a little bit. She's a middle child. She's a junior now. She had to go back to find that thing that she, and, and identify when, when it changed or when someone tried to change it. Then we went to my oldest son. He had to dig a little deeper. We went to my wife. She had to dig a little deeper. Mm -hmm. And we all talked about how the older you got, the mm -hmm. further you felt like you were away from that original idea. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting at the table saying, I'm the only one at this table that actually is living and experiencing seeding my dream and as your father and as your husband I'm the custodian of that idea and mm -hmm. I'm going to promise you that I'll protect that I, that original idea mm -hmm. for as long as I can I'll remind you of it and you do something every day that feeds that idea and don't let anybody steal that and you may not understand what it all means and mm -hmm. how it's going to all come about but as long as you keep dreaming and keep thinking about it and keep mm -hmm. living in that space then you'll be sure to uh, to embrace it in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. so, one, yeah. one of the takeaways from that that I want us to take away, especially for um, the parents that are in the audience and online as well, um, I love how you said your dad, he knew he knew what was in you, yeah. and he didn't allow anyone else, uh, even though they possibly could have been intimidated. Your <laughs> teachers possibly could have been intimidated by a fourth grader. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and your dad would not allow them to... Uh, to, you know, to sway you from what he knew you were supposed to do. And even though uh, through, through your entire life, you still kind of maintain that. And as time went on, um, it evolved into you sitting right here today. But it was always on that path. It was always, you know, mm -hmm. my father, my father, uh, I used to be frustrated that he wasn't a lot of things for me relational. Okay. And I would, I would, in a sense, penalize him uh, in our relationship for not being my idea of those things. Mm -hmm. But when, as I got older, the things that he was supposed to be for me in terms of a motto and a man and foundation and, and protecting my identity, like I love my dad and embrace mm -hmm that and thank him for being that in that space mm -hmm. even though he wasn't in other spaces that I thought relationally but I had to become a man to understand mm -hmm. that it was his role one of the earliest things that my dad told me was that I was going to be an astronaut 
My father said, you're an astronaut. He was so clear about it. Really? You're an astronaut. You're an astronaut. And as a okay. young man, I would reject, I'm not no astronaut. <laughs> I'm not flying in this spaceship. I don't even like science like that. You know, son, you're an astronaut. You, you'll understand one day. And I, and I rejected it and fought against it. When I turned 21, mm -hmm. uh, I, I had this epiphany and I called my dad. I said, dad, when mm -hmm. you said that I'm going to be an astronaut, you didn't mean literally. You meant like taking new territory and expanding in the spaces and being a trailblazer and exploring beyond the normal and being comfortable being different. He's like, ah, my son, now you get it. <laughs> you know, he's such a wise sage. You know, he was just like, he's like, that's exactly what I meant. Like, yeah. I didn't mean it in the literal sense. I meant it in the explore, in the in the creative sense mm -hmm. of what an astronaut is. And I was able to embrace that and it was able to chart my course. So I'm always comfortable in my own skin, being different, doing what I'm doing, trying new things, doing things never done before, because my father set that tone in me as a child, even before I ever got to explore it. He was what you needed. He was what I needed. Absolutely. Exactly. He was what you needed. Uh, some more quotes from the book. Uh, the book started as self-therapy. When, when I first started reading it, that's like the first few pages of it, uh, that really stuck out to me that the book started as self-therapy, evaluating your past uh, to evaluate your future. That's another quote. And another quote that really sat with me was sitting with yourself. <laughs> so all of these, I mean, I understand. Let me ask you this question. Um, what caused you to feel like you needed to sit with yourself? What caused you to feel like um, you needed self therapy and what caused you to feel like I need to take a moment here and I need to evaluate some things. What was going on in your life that, that caused that to happen, Dr. Glenn? You know, I know that I appear to be an extrovert, but I really enjoy reflection, intro, mm. introspection. Yes. It's the healthiest way to understand who you are and where you are, right? Mm -hmm. The future is in the past. Everything that is created it comes from a cell. It comes from a DNA. It comes from a small thing that turns into a big thing, right? So the future, whatever something is going to be to to become a tree is in a seed, right? So the future is always in the past. If you understand the seed, you understand the tree. If you want to understand the tree, you got to get to the seed, get to the root of what it is. I ask real weird questions of my parents. I asked them on the night that I was conceived. You know, was was y'all getting it in? Was it on purpose? Was it an accident? Was it an accident? Was it a mistake? Like, mm -hmm. what was going on? You know, I wanted to understand how I came about. You know, my dad was like, no, actually, my twin brother, because my dad's a twin, my twin mm -hmm. brother had a child. We went over to see him. The child looked just like my brother. I got in the car with your mom. I said, hmm, I wonder if we had a child. Would it look just like me? She said, I don't know. Let's go find out. And we went and found out. We went home. We made, we, we had, we, 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 we got together and we created you and you look nothing like me early on. You know? But, but he's like, literally that was the night you were conceived. And I'm like, wow, that's really cool. So the future is always in the past. I think that people live out so much that they don't spend enough time living in. Yes, so yeah. we're going, 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 what's next, what's next, what's next, instead of sitting with yourself and saying, who am I? What do I want? What do I care about? What matters? What? Where have I been? What is my journey? What do I understand? What do I want to know more of? Uh, what happened when I was a child? What happened in my growing up? How did it shape me? How did it impact me? Who, who bothered me? Who? What, what things about my life uh, frustrate me or impact me in a way? When you understand who you are, your gifts, your talents, your abilities, and sit with yourself, mm -hmm. sitting with your yourself is a, is a place of healing. It's a place of resolve. It's a place where you get revelation. Then you can live out. I am, therefore I do. I don't mm -hmm. do so I can become. Mm -hmm. I am becoming. And, and out of my becoming is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm doing out of who I am. And people sit with themselves then they become more attractive for what's assigned to them because sitting with yourself is not a is not a fearful place. Everything in the future comes from the past. Yeah, when you sit with yourself, you have to come to grips with yourself. That's right. I think a lot of people don't want to sit with themselves because sometimes it's painful. Yeah. You know, but it's a painful place when you have to accept what you did. What's going on? Why am I here? What right. was my role? Right. You know, and so sometimes it can be a painful place. So I think um, uh, you sitting with yourself introspectively, I think it's very brave. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's brave. I think you can mm -hmm. find the. I think there is pain, but pain mm -hmm. is purposeful. Mm -hmm. right? So it is a painful place, mm -hmm. but if you can understand it, you can find resolve because it's all a part of the process. Absolutely. The, bu the book talks about Joseph sitting with himself. He got mm -hmm. his big dream. He's excited. He tells his brothers brothers throw him in a pit and he has to sit with himself. Mm -hmm. How did I get here? How did I go from being mm -hmm. a dreamer? This wasn't my idea. God give me this big picture of myself. The first people I think I can trust is my family. I share it with them. They turn on me, throw me in a pit. What is happening here? But that solace, that sitting with yourself mm -hmm. helps you to embrace the dream, help mm -hmm. you to realize that it's real and try to figure out what's going to happen next in this journey called life. So it can be painful but if you sit with yourself, you can find purpose in the pain. Absolutely. Also, yeah. um, speaking about sitting with yourself, I, I want you to say, ask, um, I want you to uh, elaborate rather on this. In a way, you ended up living out that dream, but how did you reconcile the pain of your expectations of God's timing? Now that right there, yeah. when it's not your time, but it's God's time. Now. That could be quite painful. That's painful. Mm -hmm. I mean, we put these expectations and these timelines on ourselves mm -hmm. and on God. God do it by this time. God <laughs> do it by this time. Church perpetuates that something. Three days, he gonna do it. Seven days. Yeah, and then yeah. if he don't do it in seven days, you're like, God, you know, but a day <laughs> with God is a thousand years. I right. mean, you know what I mean? So it's like we put these timelines on God with these expectations without realizing your steps are ordered and you'll come, if you master the present moment you're in, it'll mature you to the next moment, mm -hmm. right? So people are so fast to get to the next moment, they haven't mastered this moment. The worst thing you could do is go to the next season when you haven't milked this season. The worst thing you could do is rush into the next thing and you haven't mastered the thing that you're in. So hurry up to be married and you haven't mastered being single. And now mm -hmm. you're looking at your marriage going, man, I should have did three more things when I was single. You know, whatever that is. So it's like embrace whatever seat and whatever season you're in. Learn what you're supposed to learn in the atmosphere and the environment that you're in so you can mm -hmm. master that moment. When you master that moment, you don't have to search for the next one. It will manifest. It will mature you until you mm -hmm. outgrow it. You stretch it. You can't fit it anymore. It matures you to the next moment. You almost stumble into the next moment mm -hmm. in a moment of preparation that is totally unexpected because where you are no longer fits. Mm -hmm. Now, how God gets you there is sometimes painful disappointment, uh, being lied on, being threatened, being pushed out, being misunderstood, uh, doing all you can, knowing all you can do, it not being received. Rejection sometimes ends up pushing you because, you know, they say rejection is not just rejection, it's redirection. So if you can't go this way, maybe you go that way. And so uh, It's also God's protection. It's God's protection, that's right. <laughs> and, and, and so sometimes it's like you can be afraid, well, why didn't this work? Well, God didn't let that work because mm -hmm. he really wanted something else to work but when we, we trust the timing of God we reconcile his timing is always perfect I do not have to rush it I do not have to force it all I have to do is embrace where I am master the moment do my very best in this moment with mm -hmm. this time steward this time the best that I can and when when I'm ready then I'll get to the next place mm -hmm. and the next moment for those of us that are uh, in the audience, I just really want you, the takeaway that I want you to receive from what Dr. Glenn just said is just to relax. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the bottom line. For those of you that are online, just, just type relax in the chat. Yeah. Just say, I am going to relax yeah. because that is the perfect place for you to be with the Lord. Just relax. He knows exactly what he's doing. He uh, for those of uh, I mean, if we have any millennials here today or those of you under 30, just relax. Yeah. I'm telling you, when you get to where God wants you to be, it'll be the perfect time for you. Nothing will be left out. Uh, that's, that's another thing that I think we have to understand as well. When we get to that point, every ingredient that you need it, you will have it. It'll be there. <laughs> it it will be, it'll show up. Nothing lacking, nothing missing. Right. Nothing shalom, broken. shalom, peace, yeah, peace, shalom. peace. It's, it's all there. All right. I can testify. If I look yes. back over my life, it's yes. like, Waiting and mastering the moment and mm -hmm. preparing you for the next moment is the perfect plan. Yes. It doesn't mean you be passive 
about. Wait, waiting is active. It right. doesn't mean you're passive. It doesn't mean you're lazy or slothful. Mm -hmm. But you're literally uh, upping your skill, developing your talent, developing your identity, mm -hmm. developing yourself, doing well at what you do. Mm -hmm. And it produces this, this next beautiful moment for you that you could not, that you could not imagine. Uh, it exceeds your expectations. Absolutely. So reconciling the timing mm -hmm. of God is just like, I trust the timing of God. Can mm -hmm. you just type that on the screen? Yes. Can you write that in your notes? Mm -hmm. I trust. Can you say it out? Wow, yes. I trust, I trust the, the timing time of, God. of God. The timing of God. Mm -hmm. God has a way of, of catch, letting you play catch up on your, in your mind and make up time by just mastering the moment. Absolutely. Yeah. Before we move forward, I just want to say this too. Waiting is a verb. It is a verb. As it's you said. Action. Yeah, you're yeah. still doing something. When you're waiting, it's not like you're not still. You're right. still in your spirit yeah. because you're not going ahead of God. Right. But you still are doing something. You know, you're still doing something in that place because waiting is still preparation. Waiting. Yeah, you're still doing something. You're just still doing something while you're waiting. I'm enjoying talking to right, you. Are y'all having a good time? Yeah, this is, I love talking to you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. I am really enjoying it. Okay, so... Um, other quotes that are from the book, you, if you haven't read it yet, or if you're going to, of course you're going to read it, you have the book, but if you've read it already, you've seen these quotes. Uh, submitting to your seat, that, that was one that I, I really I really wanted to re, um, elaborate on. Every single seat, I love this, is a significant seat or it wouldn't exist. That's right. I love that. <laughs> one more, um, interpreting someone else's dream and then the last one, sewing up. A lot of time, people don't realize uh, sewing up is the best way to sew. Well, listen, <laughs> sewing up is the only way to sew. Right? <laughs> it's the only way to sew. Yeah. A lot of times, people feel like you know they should sew beneath themselves, and there's nothing wrong with it. Just whenever we talk about anything, be led of the Lord. Okay, yeah. that's why we want everybody to be saved and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Be led of the Lord. But but as a general statement, sewing up. Yeah. Is the way you come up. Yeah, it's the way you come up. It's the way you come up by sewing up. So my question to you is uh, Joseph had the responsibility of serving other people's dreams in every place that he went. How do you relate to that in your story? Mm -hmm. And uh, what lessons uh, can you teach others from that? Ah, that's a great question. Can, can, I, I, can I just say one thing before, before, we, before you answer, answer the question? Um, I also want you to um, elaborate on um, taking taking your seat as an executive pastor, that's sewing up, mm -hmm. to support, you know, a, a, a pastoral position mm -hmm. that's sewing up as well. So I want you to elaborate on all of that. That was like mm -hmm. six questions in one. <laughs> <laughs> but you're Dr. Glenn. You're uh, Dr. Glenn. You could give me a whole synopsis of all of them. <laughs> so I think I think that in in I think when people realize it. Yeah. Purpose is interdependent, right? Okay. So in reality, we are all serving someone else's idea in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Everybody is interchangeably supporting something else simultaneously while you're doing your thing. Life works best when you're with other people doing your thing and they're doing their thing and they're benefiting from you doing your thing and you're benefiting from them doing their thing. Mm -hmm. And if we all, uh, uh, God created us in, 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 that, in that interdependence where there is a healthy sense of support and, and value that's added in every space, right? And, and mm -hmm. Jesus flipped leadership upside down that even if you're quote unquote at the top, you're still serving everyone else. But being in leadership just simply means you're the biggest leader, you're the biggest server. And being in leadership meaning that you are the one that is responsible for serving everyone else in some capacity or not, right? And so I think that interchangeably, we're all fulfilling and helping someone else fulfill and live their dream. Now, the catch is alignment. The catch is finding the dream that's in alignment with your dream, right? So that that sacrifice is sowing up. That sacrifice mm. is a seed because it's already in alignment with the idea that you have. They're just further alone or in a different capacity or in a different space in the same space that you're in. If you can get in alignment with someone else's idea that also is your idea and help push that idea further along, you're going to get there further faster. Mm. And so 
uh, and so understanding who you are. Because you're sowing into your future. You're sowing it. Everybody mm -hmm. is sowing. If you sow mm -hmm. anything, if you sow anything, it's for it to grow later. If yes. you sow anything, it's for you to see it later. Mm -hmm. it, it, then mm -hmm. I always tell people, debt is paying for your past, right? Mm -hmm. Debt is paying for your past. Anytime you're in debt to something or someone, you're paying for what already happened. Mm -hmm. But when you're sowing, it's for your future. Mm -hmm. Sowing is an investment into your future because sowing is for your future. Mm -hmm. It's not for your past. You don't see it right away, but you know it's good ground. You know what you planted. You know that it's going to come up. You know that it's going to produce something at the time you need it most in the future. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of every seat is significant is don't belittle any seat that you're sitting in because every seat is sowing into the future. And you want to be a business owner? Be a, you want to be a good business owner? Be a good employee so that when you become a business owner, you know that you sow to be a good employee so you'll have what? Good employees mm -hmm. around you. Whatever steward every opportunity Opportunity that you're in and every moment that you're in as if it's an investment into your future mm -hmm. because it is absolutely and so on my journey uh, I started my first job in church was a janitor my first job in church was to clean up you know what I mean and mm -hmm. then it was a church clerk then it was a, a armor bearer then it was a youth pastor and and so it went on and on and on as I was in the environment of ministry and the atmosphere that I wanted to be in I always tell people if you want to be something, get in the room where it is. If you want to be a doctor, well, go work at the hospital, you know, even if you're a security guard or if you work in the cafeteria. Why? Because you're around doctors. You're around the people that you want to be. And eventually, that opportunity to serve that seat, serve that space, gives you exposure for the next thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think that I got in the environment and knowing my identity, who I was, you know who you are, you can serve anybody, anywhere, in any way. Because mm -hmm. That is a role, and that role doesn't diminish you, make you, or anything. I am, therefore I do. Therefore, I can serve any role because I know who I am. It doesn't matter. I play many roles. I'm a husband. I'm a brother. I'm a father. I'm a son. I'm a business owner. I'm an executive pastor. I'm an apostle to some people. I sit uh, on, on, on boards and lead pastors. I pastor pastors, and I, I'm under and I'm over at the same time. When you know who you are, then you can serve anywhere in any space because mm -hmm. you know who you are and you do what's most appropriately needed for the space and the seat that you're in. And as long as you're in the actual environment and atmosphere of the idea that God originally put in your head, it doesn't take anything from you. It only adds value to you, either now or later. So the best thing you can do is get around where you're going and serve it and sow into it, and then you'll grow into it. That's, that's the easiest way. God has invested so much in you. I mean, do you realize all the things you just told me? <laughs> you, you're telling me this is a loaded question. I'm talking to a loaded man right here. I think you, there is so, I mean, he's, he's, there's so much in you, Dr. Glenn. They're just so, so let me ask you this question. Do you feel like everyone has um, multiple gifts like you have? Or, uh, or is it um, kind of relative to each person? Or, or do you think you're like that because you just really knew how to sit with yourself? You knew how to evaluate. You knew how to really dig deep within to see everything that, that, was, that is within you. I'll, I'll answer it in two parts. First, okay. first, you said there's really a lot in me. I yes. think if there's any weight of responsibility that I feel every day yes. is the weight of how much investment yes. has been made in me yes. to become myself. Mm -hmm. I think I think the teachers, my leaders, my teachers, my trainers, uh, I, I talk about this in my book, Mentors, all of the 120 years that I added up mm. of ministry, life and development that has intentionally poured into me. My father, my godfather, my grandfather, mm. my uncles, mm -hmm. the deacons at the church, the past, like how many men have spoken into my life to help me to become a man. So when I think about the, the weight of the responsibility of how much investment has been put in me has been placed in me so that I can develop and invest people. If I wrestle with anything, I'm like, God, let me steward this. What, if, what do you want to do with all, all of this of investment this. that mm -hmm. you made in me? Why did you make me like this? Mm -hmm. What is my role, my assignment in the wealth that you placed in mm -hmm. my life? I want to steward it 
well. That's more than the timing of God and when I'm on the next place and when the next door opening for me. Those are not the prayers that I pray. Mm -hmm. The prayers that I pray is what do you want me to do with what's been deposited and invested in me? Help me to steward that well so that I'm in that space and pouring that out. I think all of us need to adapt that prayer. God, what do you want me to do with the investment that you have made in me? In the chat, I know it's a lot of words, but if you can just type that in the chat. <laughs> I'm talking to a loaded man here, so I got I got loaded chats, you know. So I just want you to really, you know, say that though. God, what do you want uh, me to do with the investment that you've made in me, even in the audience? Why don't we just repeat that, Lord? Yeah, Lord. What do you want me to, do, you want me to do with the investment, the investment that you have made that you've made in me? In me. So the second part of your question, yes. do I think that everybody has multiple things, mm -hmm. talents? Yes, I do. Yes. If everyone sincerely asks that question, mm -hmm. repeat it, write it, and think about it, you'll start to think about the layers and layers of talent. Mm -hmm. Again, we only feel like we're less than when we compare ourselves to someone else. Mm -hmm. If I look out then I say, oh, I can't sing like I can't sing like Pastor Erica. I can't, but I can sing like Jamon Glenn. Mm -hmm. She can't do what I do. You know, mm -hmm. her voice is way beautiful than mine's, but mm -hmm. she don't have my swag. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> she can't. She can't. She can't do what I do the way I do. I don't so, think anybody has your swag, Dr. Glenn. <laughs> so, so I only, you're pretty swaggy. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, only, I only get caught up in comparison if I look out. Mm. If I look in, right. I start to realize my responsibility mm -hmm. to my talents, mm -hmm. to my skills, what I do, the way I do it, the way I, I, I move, the way I operate. And then I have a responsibility to master those things. Everybody can do three things, four things. Mm -hmm. You just have to find the things that you know how to do, learn how to do them well, master them, get people that coach you up or mentor you in the areas that you want to develop, steward it, and that's your opportunity to serve it. Once you steward it and you find it and you serve it, you serve it, serving it creates the opportunity. That's the Joseph journey. That's my journey. That's your journey. That's everybody's that's watching journey. They just haven't noticed it. We outside looking in the Joseph story like, oh man, Joseph is in that story like, I just got thrown in the pit by my brothers. What in the world? Now I'm at Potiphar's house. His wife trying to rape me and chase me. I had to leave out, leave my clothes in there. I was, uh, then, I, then they threw me in a prison and lied on me. Each moment, it feels wrong. We're looking at the story like, yeah, but in every moment you came to the top. But every moment you stewarded and you mastered the moment and you got elevated to the next moment. Every moment put you into the next moment till eventually you ended up in the seat that you saw yourself in when you first got the dream, but it didn't happen the way you thought it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. It happened through this long process from the pit to the palace mm -hmm. is a long process, 17 year process, 17 year journey. You shared this idea with your brothers. They couldn't see it. They didn't agree with it. But then when you help fulfill someone else's dream, you realize you're sitting in your own dream. Wow. You're not sitting in your own dream until you help somebody else fulfill their dream. Mm -hmm. And then when your brothers come and see you, you have to reveal yourself to him because you don't even look like what you've been through. Wow. They don't even recognize you. He has to literally say, I am, oh, by the way, I am Joseph. <laughs> the one you threw in the pit, the one you said this will never happen, mm -hmm. the one you said the dream will never manifest. I'm literally him. And they looking at him like, we thought you were dead. We thought it was over. Mm -hmm. We thought it was through. No, 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 no. God pushed me through a process that was unpopular, and I took all of that in the journey, stewarded my gifts, stewarded my skills, mastered in the prison my ability to interpret dreams. So when I got called to interpret the dream, I was ready to interpret the dream because when I was in obscurity, when I was developing in the dark, when I was behind the scenes, that's where I developed my skill. So when I got called to the palace, I wasn't fumbling over no words. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, uh, Pharaoh, I may not know this dream, but God will give you the answer. I'm sure it is because he got me through the pit. He got me through Potiphar's house. He got me through prison. And in all these places that I've been with God, it's helped me to master who I am so I can deliver to you the interpretation of your dream. And then we celebrate Joseph for being a dreamer or an interpreter of his dream, but his real gift was administration. Wow. It really wasn't about interpreting a dream. That was just the vehicle that God used to get him to the chair. Right. When he got to the chair, he literally had to administrate the whole movement to make sure that all people could live in Egypt and all of the resources.
resources could come. It was the interpretations of Pharaoh's dream, but the administration of his gift that end up functioning in a way that sustained an entire nation. Is he using multiple dream gifts? Yes. All the administrators that think I'm behind the scenes and I don't do nothing. Joseph is an administrator. <laughs> That's what he's doing. He's stewarding a whole movement, seven years of this and seven years of that, and put this up and put that up, and people do this and do this, and all of these ideas is him using multiple gifts, and in every space, he mastered the moment, and God pushed him into the next place until he was sitting in his seat. Everybody has that inside of Absolutely. Did y'all get that? I got excited. <laughs> Did y'all get that? I'm going to go on to, to uh, um, my next quotes, but right before we move from this space, I just wanted to add this one thing. When uh, Dr. Glenn was talking about all of us have different gifts and we have different talents and God has invested so much in, into us, I want you also to take this away from this moment today. You don't do everything at one time sometimes. You're always evolving. You're always evolving. Some things you did maybe in your teen years, your 20s, your 30s. Uh, I'm going to be moving into a next decade real soon, and I have some more ideas. That's right. That I have never done before. Great. And I know that it's the will of God. So right. never stop evolving. Never think, you know, that it's over, I'm done. You know, because all of those things that God has placed in you, you will do them before you meet him face to face. That's right. Because when everything that God placed in your heart, there's enough time for it. That's right. So if you're still living, you have time to do it. If you're still breathing, you have time to do it. I want you to just say this. Say, I will do, I will do everything, everything that God has called me to do. I'm having a good time. Are y'all having a good time? Yes. <laughs> you were I done, will. you would be dead. Absolutely. <laughs> I Absolutely. Not, I had time to do it. Absolutely. I, I love that you're still dreaming. I am. You should. I absolutely That's am. That's right. And I encourage everyone else to do it as well. That's right. One last question. We have time for one more? We can do it. Okay. I have um, some, some um, more quotes that I loved in your book. Uh, in order to secure God's plans, you have to be secure in your identity. Destiny is settled in identity. Didn't I tell you that everything is a t-shirt? <laughs> 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 now you understand what I when when I in my open when I said I'm I'm reading this book like whoa Dr. Glenn all right oh yes everything is a T-shirt so I, my last question to you after this last question we're going to take some questions from the audience so you guys prepare yourself for that okay all right so my last question is uh, once we know who we are we can be uh, seated after that right yeah but but do your seats change. And how do we deal with that in our everyday lives? That's Can I add just a little more to it? I, I know I'm giving you a lot. You said I gave you a lot. Go ahead. <laughs> and um, I, want us to, I want us to close tonight with you uh, giving us some wisdom on how can we know unequivocally that we are in the right seat. That's great. So yes, your seats can change. They will change. They will evolve in space and time. You're not playing musical chairs. You're not fighting over a chair. You're not fighting over a seat. You make the seat, the seat don't make you, right? So the seat represents something, but it's, but it's you. That's why I said destiny is settled in your identity. Everybody is searching, searching, searching for destiny, but destiny is in the identity. The future is where? It's in the past, and mm -hmm. it's in the core. And so as you realize and recognize your personal identity uh, in who God made you, who you're created to be, uh, what, what skills, talents, and abilities you have, what you care about, what you're passionate about, what you love, these things in who you are helps you navigate the right fit. So you know if you're in the right space or the wrong space. You know if you're in the right seat or the wrong seat because if it's outside of your character, who you are, what you dreamed, or how you saw yourself. You know, as kingdom citizens, uh, the, the idea that God wants you to have is you're supposed to spend your life becoming. You're supposed mm. to spend your life becoming, right? Not doing. Human being, not human doing. Mm. We spend our life human doing mm. instead of human being. 
and it is the human being that causes you uh, to come into alignment and agreement with your assignment with God and your seats and your roles change because you are in the right environments and in the right mm. atmospheres and in the right spaces. And when you know who you are, you can serve in any space because you recognize the seat don't make you. It doesn't make you. It doesn't, you, mm. can, you can be secure in your identity if you think that the role makes you, the title makes you, the position makes you. Most roles, titles, and positions are men given. So then they can be taken. Gifts mm. are God given. Gifts are God given. So gifts can't be taken from you because God gave them to you. A man didn't give it to you. God gave it to you. God gave you your gifts so that you can live and use your gifts in your life for his glory. Titles men give you to give you manipulation, authority, power, whatever that is. And so if a man can give you a title, a position, or a seat, he can take it from you. If you attach your life too much to that role and not have revelation of your personal identity, then when the role shift, you'll lose yourself. Mm. And people lose themselves because they let the role become their identity instead of their identity being their identity so they can fulfill any role. I know who I am, so mm. because I know who I am, I'm a good man, I'm a good husband, I'm a good son, I'm a good father, role, I'm a good friend, role, I'm a good pastor, role, teacher, pastor, evangelist, whatever, administrator. I can serve in any space that supports my gifting mm. because God gave me the gift to serve. And the title of the role of the position don't mean anything to me because you can take that anytime you get mad at me. Because you're a human being. I'm a human being, not a human <laughs> doing. You be that. I'm being. Right? <laughs> right. And if people can get back to being a human being. I love it. And everything you do comes out of who you are. I am, therefore I do. Everything I do comes out of who I am instead of me trying to do to be. So then I'm not seeking your affirmation by what I'm doing. So that that gives me some kind of sense of identity of who I am. Be I who know you are. who I am. Be who and you because are. of who I yes. am, then I, because of who you yeah. are, I asked you what you come here. Because mm -hmm. of who you are, I asked you, could you share in this moment? Mm -hmm. It's because of you, not just what you, you do, who, you do what you do because of who you are. Mm. Not the other way around. We don't like that. When people are doing something that they're not, we call that fake. When people are doing something that they're not, we say, look at them trying to act like they, they know they they know they're not good at that. But when you see somebody stand in their identity and do out of what they have become, mm -hmm. you can feel it. It's tangible. It mm -hmm. flows. It's authentic. You attach to it. You connect to it. You're like, man, that's amazing. Because you see them doing what they were born to do because they spent time being. And so if we spend time being, let the seat change. Take the title, take the position, let the city change, let the seat change, let the crowd change, let the PA don't really matter. Because when I get there, I'm going to show up as me. I'm doing what I do because I am who I am. You can't take it. You can't, you can't fire me because you ain't hire me. Wow. You, can't, you can't take it from me because you ain't called me. And the truth of the, of the matter is when you realize that God gave me these gifts and no one can take them away, then all I'm responsible for is stewarding and matching. Mastering my gifts so that God gets the glory. And God is responsible for putting me in the greatest position that he can get the most glory out of what he put in my life. All I have to do is be who I am. Be who he created me to be. <laughs> Let us make man in mm -hmm. our image and mm -hmm. in our likeness. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. right? Right. Be fruitful and multiply. Be mm -hmm. fruitful mm -hmm. and multiply, mm -hmm. right? Subdue, mm -hmm. have dominion over mm -hmm. the earth. All of this is out of the identity. God says, let me breathe into you so you can be. And mm. man became mm. a living soul. Let me breathe into you so you can become like me. Mm. And when you become like me, and you get up and you look around, everything you need is in your atmosphere and in your environment. You can just start speaking things and naming things and calling things to you and moving in things. Why? Because you have become. And when you become what belongs to you, finds you. Mm. A lot of people can't get what belongs to them because they haven't become their most authentic self. So your stuff is looking for the real you, and you yeah. haven't become the real you, right. so it can't find you. It can't even find you. Can't find you. Can't find you. Can't Can find we you. applause? Can we do something here? Because I'm telling you, I need to hear something, some snacks, some something. Can't find you. 
And, wow. and, and, and that's and that's why people It's amazing. That's why people are chasing <laughs> seats. Yes. Thinking that the seat makes them significant. Mm -hmm. And that's why the subtitle of this book is Every Seat is Significant. Mm -hmm. Discover your seat. Because the seat, you don't have to chase seats. When you have reservations. Yes. Mm -hmm. When you have reservations, you don't have to chase a seat. You just walk up and give your name. Mm -hmm. We've been expecting you, and your seat <laughs> is right here. And then you come and you take your seat. Yes. Nobody can sit in your seat. Why? Because it's your seat. You just be seated. Just be seated. <laughs> come on here, right? <laughs> you just be seated. And when you be seated, it fits you, it's for you, it's right for you. And you look around, who else is in their seat? Hey, how you doing? What's up? You in your seat? You yes, in your seat? Yes. Oh, you in your seat? And, yes. and that's the environment you want to be in. Absolutely. And so when people start chasing seats and they realize, hmm, where am I seated right now? Right, right. And in the seat that I'm in right now, what am I supposed to be doing? Yes. What am I supposed to be learning? Who am I supposed to be helping? Who else is around me in this space? What relationships have I avoided? What connections are in this moment in time mm -hmm. that I may never get again? Why am I in this city at this point in time? And why am I meeting these people at this point in time? And what is it that I'm supposed to get out of this that I'll never get again if I rush to the next place without mastering the place that I'm in? Absolutely. And that's the journey. And that's why you sit with yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's the journey that I've taken, you've taken, mm -hmm. and everybody I've taken, whether they realize it or not, not, they haven't just been still enough to recognize mm -hmm. it. Well, you definitely answered our question. Didn't he answer it? Uh, I want you to say this to your neighbor. This is what I, the takeaway I want us to take away from uh, Dr. Glenn answering that question about how do we unequivocally know where we should be seated. I want you to say this to someone next to you. Say, be who you are. Be who you are. And be seated. And be seated. That's it. That's how we know. I asked him, I said, how do we know? He just told us, be who you are. And be seated in the chat. Won't you uh, why don't you put that in the chat as well? Be who you, be who you are and be seated. That's good. Be seated. Let's so see. we're going to take a few questions from the audience. You ready to do that? Let's do it. Okay, let's do it. Uh, how can you take your How can you take your new seat when your old seat is so comfortable? <laughs> uh, you're not ready to take your new seat if your old seat is so comfortable. And oh wow! Uh, because God has a way of making your seat uncomfortable, uncomfortable, even if it's comfortable. Yes. Right? He's you, you absolutely. Know, you know when you plateau, you know every, yes. no one else may know. Yes, you know. But you know. Mm -hmm. You know when you're doing it in your sleep. Mm -hmm. You know when it doesn't require any more effort. No challenge. You know when you're not growing. No challenge. You know when it's, no, it's not sharpening. Yes. You yes. know when you're not using your faith to do it. Mm. You know when you know when it's, it's comfortable and convenient, but that comfort is uncomfortable. Inside yourself, comfort for, for <laughs> us who mm -hmm. made in the image of likeness of mm -hmm. God, comfort mm -hmm. is stagnant. Comfort is uncomfortable. Mm. We don't say it. We don't tell nobody, but yeah. we're uncomfortable when we're comfortable. When we're, if it's too comfortable, it's like, ah, this, this is a little too easy. You know, my life is drifting away. I need to challenge myself. Let me read a book. Let me take a class. Let me get a, a certification. Let me try. So when's the last time I tried something different? So you could, you, could, you could stall out and be comfortable in a space. It becomes boredom. It becomes boredom. It becomes mm -hmm. mundane. Mm -hmm. It becomes mediocre. Yeah. And you were not made for mediocrity. No. no. You're the head and not the tail. You're, the, you're above and not beneath. You, are, you like the final things. You're made for excellence. You're made in the image and likeness of God. So mediocrity uh, gets boring. And so you, you can stay or settle in the comfort space, but eventually something will happen to disrupt that comfort and put you in uncomfortable space, and the uncomfortable space is still going to challenge you in the next space. So mm -hmm. you, you know when, when you're ready, when, you, when life has become too comfortable. I'm not saying be reckless. Mm -hmm. right. I'm not saying be reckless. Right. But, 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 but master the moment that you're in mm -hmm. and it'll mature you to the next moment. And the next moment will require faith. Absolutely. I'll, I'll thank you for asking that question. We all benefit from that, right? <laughs> 
Wonderful question. Okay, let's let's go. You want to go further? Yes, let's go. All right, let's go. How long did it take you to write the book, and what was your biggest distraction? Whew. This was probably one of the hardest books to write. Really? Um, yeah. Dr. Glenn, can you tell us which uh, number is this for you? 20. I told you I won't wrote one, right? <laughs> Do you remember in my opening? I told Stop you I wrote no one. Comparing. One. Is, one was good for one me. One is great. Come on, one. One. One is more than most people have written. Yeah, that's true. I appreciate that, but still. <laughs> Twenty books. Okay, so Dr. Glenn, how old were you when you wrote your first book? Ah. Uh, that's a great question. I think my first book, I think I was 30, 30, 35 maybe. I think I was 35 years old I wrote my first wow. book. Wow, yeah. and so that floodgate just opened and uh, you just kept going. No, I sold into it. Mm. One share, other, one share, story. please. Yeah, so, share. So, and then I'll get back to the question. Okay. So I never, I never go to church on vacation. I never go to church on vacation, mm -hmm. but my wife is a church girl, you know, so we was going to the Bahamas. Yes. Dr. Miles Monroe is one of my mentors and teachers. Uh, first, before I ever met him, he was my mentor because I read all his books. Mm. He was my mentor because I read, I read Potential and Purpose was the main two that I read. And he was mentor. He's my mentor in my head. I didn't ever know him or nothing. We were going to the Bahamas for vacation, and I told my wife, I said, you know, I never want to go to church, but but if Dr. Miles is at church, let's mm -hmm. go on they let's go to church on vacation. Yes. I want to plant a seed in his hand. But God, wow. I'm only giving it to him if I can put it in his hand. If I can't put it in his hand, then I'm not putting it in the basket. I mm. gotta put it in his hand. Yes. She said, okay, that's great. So we get up, we call the church, they say he's gonna be at church Sunday. We get up, we go to church, we sit in the back, he's up there, he's preaching, he's teaching, it's amazing, it's awesome. At the end of service, the man gets up and says, Dr. Miles is not gonna be greeting anybody today at the church, he's going in the back. Dr. Miles was going out. He turned around and said, Who said that? He said, Yes, I am. Come meet me right over here. I said, Oh, I'm about to meet him. I put out the check to write the check to get it. To, you know, get it in my hand. I went. I sat in a bit in the end of a long line. Mm -hmm. At the end of the line, I was one of the last people to, to get to him in the line. When I met him in the line, I walked up to Dr. Miles. You're my mentor. It's such a pleasure to meet you. I'm so honored to meet you. I've read your books. I've never met you, but I know. And he's, what's your favorite book? I tell him Pursuit of Purpose. It's so good. And so he's like, great. I said, I just wanted to put this seed in your hand. Who should I make it to? He said, Who is it for? I said, It's for me. <laughs> it's, it's for you. He said, Well, write it to me. <laughs> and so I wrote the book. I wrote the check to his hand, I put it in his hand, and uh, he shook my hand and he said, I'm gonna pray for you, let me pray for you. He prayed several things for me, but one of the things he prayed for me, because I mentioned to him that he was my mentor for a book, he said, he said, you leave your legacy in a book. Whatever mm. you know, you put it in a book, it'll live beyond you. He said, I pray that you, have, you create a system mm. for writing books. Wow. I pray that God gives you a team and you have a system for writing books and that that manifests in your life. Among other things, wow. that's one of the things he prayed for me. And when I left there, I said, I gotta write a book. And that's wow. how I started. And from then, it's 20 books later, and wow. I have a system for writing books. Wow. Because I sowed, because you sowed into my future. Wow, sowing is so important. Sowing is how it happens. See, it time. is so very important. That's right, something happened inside of me, something triggered inside mm -hmm. of me. The I, seed did it. I, exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, 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 impartation mm -hmm. happened in that moment. Mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Miles has probably like over 150, 200 mm -hmm. books. Mm -hmm. uh, but something triggered inside of me. I understood what to write, how to articulate it. I developed a team mm -hmm. around that idea of editors and writers and people that transcribe and translate and edit, mm -hmm. graphic designers. All of it just came with me. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I just created a system uh, for doing it. And that's mm -hmm. how I've been able to do you it. You sewed into it because, you know, God is a farmer. Because God is a farmer. That's your favorite message. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, that's a side joke. Yeah. That's an inside joke with me and Dr. Glenn. On one Thursday night, Dr. Glenn preached a sermon, God is a farmer. Was anyone there? <laughs> oh, my God. So even even to this day, was that like two years ago? That was like almost a year. Yeah, two yeah, years ago. Probably, yeah, it was a long probably time ago. last Thursday night Bible study, y'all talk. It was, a long, <laughs> yeah, it was a long time ago. So even to this day, sometimes I'll see him, I'll say, God is a farmer. Yes. 
<laughs> because it was just such an amazing, I mean, the way you broke that down and you sowed that seed to Dr. Monroe. Yeah. And now, 20 books later. 20 books later, it is true. My mm -hmm. pastor, Dr. Martin Williams. Dr. Uh, Glenn. Yes. You sold up. I sold up. That's how it works. I sold up into the future. I didn't have any sense at that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, Doctor, my pastor, Dr. Martin Williams, who is a son of Dr. Miles Monroe, wow. then also has multiple mini books. He mm -hmm. challenged me every year. Uh, we come back to this gathering called Shake the Nations, where mm. all the leaders gather together. And he says, every time I come back, I have I put a demand on you to always show up with some written material every year. So That's for awesome. all the time of our relationship, every year when I come back, I show up with a book. Wow. I always show up with a book. Uh, that's my homework. That's how I get to think and my mm -hmm. process and get it out. So I have many processes. For yes. this one, mm -hmm. I woke up every morning uh, in February, from January to February. January is consecration. I laid my outline out in January. Mm -hmm. In February, I woke up every morning from uh, 5 o'clock to 7.30, and I wrote. Whatever came, however it came, whatever it dropped, I wrote it. I transcribed it. I wrote it. I transcribed it. I read it with my, uh, with my editor. We dumped the ideas, framed it all out. I did it for all the four weeks. When it was over in February, I was done. I gave it away. Transcribe, put it all together. When I put it all together, then we sent it to the editor. The editor pushed it back, came back. I wrote it. I looked. I liked it. So forth and so on. I put it in the seminar. It's too much to say. How to write a book in 30 days. Wow. But I literally, I literally did it. Did the process of it in 30 days. When we took Monet to uh, to Paris, uh, I had the manuscript. Monet was studying on the train to Paris. She's such a good student. She was studying on the train to Paris for her exams because she had to have exams, she'd come back, and I was writing through, uh, fighting through my book with my pastor mom, uh, Linnell Williams, and we were scratching and editing, scratching and editing, and then we sent it back to the editors, and then we went back and forth a few times, and that was it, I had to be done with it. By my birthday, I was finished. It was my goal, that went on my birthday, I was done with the process, and all I had to do was tweak it after that. We was done, we tweaked it, my team helped me get it done, my graphic designer and I, uh, I love it. We designed it. We go back and forth. He's amazing. He's a dream interpreter. Uh, I have an idea. I talk to him, and we talk through it and push it, uh, push it out. Uh, mm -hmm. Jason and Jason, Jason does that with me, and we we laid it all out and sent it back, and 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 I sent it to the publisher, and they. It's a beautiful uh, book. I love it. They loved it, and there it is. Take your seat. <laughs> Um, before we go, I have one more question I'm, I'm going to ask you from the audience, but I just wanted to interject this as well. I also met Dr. Monroe in Bahamas. Yeah. Yeah. I went to the Bahamas and I, I wanted to go, so they had some ministers come and pick me up. Yeah. And I went to um, to the church. Yeah. And I'll never forget, um, they said, you know, this is Angela Martin. She's from, you know, Chicago and all that. He's like, it's very cold there. I was like, yeah. yes, it's very cold there, you know. So he took my hand. I'll never forget it. He kissed my hand. He said, welcome to the Bahamas, the city where, where I live. Is. <laughs> exactly. So I have my little picture with him, but I, 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 so we have that in common as yes. well. We're just so connected. We're so connected. We're so connected. We're so connected. One more question. Is that okay? Yes, let's All go. right, this is the okay. last one. Let's what go. inspired you, uh, what inspired you to write Take Your Seat? Um, inspire me to write Take Your yeah. Seat. So yeah. I think that I got this revelation long before uh, the shift happened for mm. me to come from Grand Rapids to Chicago. I got the revelation wow. that Joseph's, that the story was about Joseph, but Joseph mm -hmm. wasn't the, he wasn't the, so to speak, the first seat or the first man. He was the second man. Okay. Right, so the book of Genesis, the story, 17 through 37, is Joseph's story as a dream interpreter. But Joseph is not the main one in charge. Pharaoh is in charge. Mm -hmm. Joseph is the administrator to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the, the lead person. Joseph is the governor. He's the mm -hmm. one that's responsible for administrating, interpreting the dream. And so I got this idea from Joseph's idea of being seated in this space. And then the kingdom of God, uh, like I said, shape the nations. In, in the kingdom of God, we have this idea that everybody has a seat, that everyone has a role, and everybody has a position to play, and every seat is significant. And I want to, I'm, I'm a developer by nature and an empowerer, and I always try to make sure that people aren't competing over other spaces, and that everybody knows where you are is where you belong, you are needed, you are necessary, and God. 
God has called you to the kingdom and to your seat for such a time. Because every this. seat is significant every or seat, it would not exist. Or it would not exist. Mm -hmm. Paul tries to explain it by painting the picture of how a body works. You know, mm -hmm. uh, every part in the body has a function. Every part, and if anything Many in members. your body, and, right, anything mm -hmm. in your body isn't functioning, then we call that body sick. And so everybody has a role, everybody has to embrace your role, embrace, embrace your place in society, in the world, and take your seat with confidence. Sit in every seat like it's a throne, because it is, because mm. everybody's a child of God, everybody's yes. a kingdom citizen, that. everybody's a king and a queen. So no matter where you are, you sit in it like a throne. If it wasn't that. a throne, it just became a throne. Can we just say that? Can we just, can we just say every seat is a throne? Every just seat is a throne. Oh, I love that. <laughs> it, yeah. There's another t-shirt. <laughs> Every, every seat is a throne. Every seat is a throne. Wow. And, and when you sit in that space and fully embrace your God-given identity wow. and your God-given role that he's called you to, then no matter what journey, in every space Joseph was in, he took his seat. Mm. He took full responsibility for the place that he was in until that place matured him into the next place. Mm. Burned him. He had no control of moving to the next seat. He had no control of moving to the next space. The only thing he could do was steward the moment, master the moment, utilize his gifts, and then when it was time, it pushed him to the next place. Wow. Everybody looks back on their life and you master where you are. God will mature you to the next seat and the next place. And when you get there, know that every space, the space that you're in, is significant. There's a reason why you're here. There's a reason why you they, they call for you. They mm -hmm. look for you, for you to do what you do. And when as God deploys you and aligns you and brings you into agreement with your assignment, embrace that in totality and find your seat of significance. If you're a mama, a grandmother, a auntie, a cousin, a mentor, whatever role you play, it's a role. Get revelation about your role and embrace the seat that you're in and sit in it with authority. Wow. Sit in it proud mm -hmm. because this seat has been shaped for you, defined for you, is waiting for you. Nobody can take it. Nobody, you don't have to fight over it. You don't have to wrestle it. What's for you is for you. Just be you. And when you be you, then everything that's assigned to you will come looking for you. Seek ye first the kingdom mm -hmm. of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You become a magnet for manifestation mm -hmm. as you become. Spend your time becoming. Spend your time becoming. Embrace the seat that you're in, and God will make the, make the rest make sense for you. Be so who I you wrote, are and I wrote, be seated. That's right. Be seated. Mm -hmm. I wrote, take your seat so that everybody can do just that. Take mm -hmm. your seat. Mm -hmm. No no, no, no need for leaving empty seats and empty mm -hmm. spaces. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. Wonderful. Did you all enjoy this tonight? I so enjoyed this conversation with you. I want to make a, mm -hmm. a, a quick moment before you wrap me up. Okay. <laughs> uh, in the front of the book, I wrote, I wrote something that was pretty significant to me. I dedicated it to uh, John Hill. Um, because mm. when I shifted seats from an executive pastor to a senior pastor, mm -hmm. John Hill was one of the people that helped me understand how the nuances of this work. He's a, as a second man, mm -hmm. you know, uh, helped facilitate so many things. And I always respected how he navigated and how he moved. Uh, people see Pastor Hannah on stage in the front, but all of that stuff that was happening off stage was like Pastor John Hill and his team that was developing. There's so many people that sit in so many spaces. I dedicated the book to my family. I dedicated the book to all the administrators, all the people that work behind the scenes. I always shout out my camera people and the people that you can't see because it's so significant what they do. And if they weren't doing, the behind the scenes people are as significant as the people that are on the scene. So don't underestimate any seat that you're sitting in. Master it. Sit in it. Embrace it until you go to the next moment. The next moment is looking for you. Absolutely. But it's looking for you as a master <laughs> of the last moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much. Did you enjoy this tonight? I so enjoyed being here with Dr. Glenn. This book is amazing. Make sure that you get the book. Take your seat. Be who God has called you to be so that you can be seated. Thank you for this opportunity to share with you. 
I am honored that I was able to sit with you and discuss this amazing book, Your 20th Child. <laughs> I love you so much. Your 20th, I'm so happy to be with you. So I'll just uh, hand it over to you. You can close this out. Yeah, I love okay. you so much and I appreciate you. you. Thank you. My this pleasure. was a, a joy to talk with you. Um, My pleasure. If you don't know Dr. Angie Martin, please follow her, connect with her. She is phenomenal, a uh, woman of God, an intercessor, an author, um, <laughs> and so many other things. Uh, she's phenomenal, and thank you for sharing in this space. Absolutely. And, uh, provoking. You know, uh, Bishop Tudor told me that there's certain things you won't say unless you're seated with someone that, that provokes those things out of you. So thank you for being here and provoking those things. Absolutely. Any wisdom that was gained in this moment was because you provoked it because the people that came tonight mm -hmm. were in the room with the right level of curiosity. Absolutely. And she said, if you don't have this book, mm -hmm. uh, we got a bundle, we got a book, we got a study guide. Uh, you version put it on an app. We got t-shirts, we got hoodies, uh, we got all types of things that you can go to my website, jamonaland.com, and order, 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 and connect with this movement called Take Your Seat, because every seat is significant. Thank you for joining us on this uh, version of the Afterglow with Dr. Angie Martin. Take your seat tonight, and I need you to go and let your light shine wherever you are. Get in alignment and agreement with God and yourself. Take your seat because every seat is significant. Thank you. Peace. Come on, y'all. Give it up for everybody. Thank you so much. That's real.